In this penultimate uh, seminar, and we hope that this will complete the series of uh, seminars that we've organized this term, they're being organized by uh, head of research and learning, Sriya Chatterjee. And it's, a, it's, it's, been, it's been a wonderful series, partly in the way it, it's dovetailed so nicely with an event that we organized, a, a conference that we organized at the Barbican um, called Strange Universes, which itself, a strange universe, which itself complemented the amazing post-war modern show at Barbican. And we, Sri and I and the team here decided that we'd make this, we'd devote this term largely to, um, to post-war visual culture in Britain. And it's generated some amazing research and papers and presentations. And I'm sure tonight we'll just maintain that fantastic quality. I'm really pleased to say that um, we'll be, I'll be introducing Ben Hyman in a second. I think I need to say a word or two about housekeeping. As always, one, I think there's a, I, I think I remember it now, off the fire. we're not planning a fire alarm tonight. So if you hear a fire alarm, you can all uh, quietly and calmly walk downstairs and exit through either of our two exits and we'll gather outside uh, in the square. You'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll help you in that. So as I said, we're not expecting a fire alarm tonight. Um, but now I just want to very quickly welcome our chair for tonight, Ben Highmore. Uh, as so many of you will know, uh, is someone who, coming from a fine art and an art historical background, and now teaching cultural studies at Sussex, uh, has been one of our most stimulating and interesting thinkers around post-war uh, British culture, uh, ranging across a huge array of materials, both visual and literary and cultural. And it's a treat to have Ben, who published a major book on brutalism with us uh, just a few years ago, uh, with us tonight, introducing our wonderful speakers, uh, Ben and Vicky. So lots of Bens here tonight, but the first one, Ben Highmore, can I turn over to you? Thank you very much, everyone. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so yeah, so the theme of tonight is post-war contemporary. Um, what's going to happen is I'm just going to say a few introductory words uh, and then Victoria Walsh will speak um, and then uh, Ben Cranfield will speak. I think they're speaking for about 20 minutes each, perhaps a bit more, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, and then I will sit amongst them and we'll have a conversation uh, and then we'll open the floor and uh, to both the, the, the floor here, the real floor and the virtual floor uh, online. Um, so yeah, so when I was asked if I, would, <coughs> if I would chair this session and I found out it was uh, uh, Ben and Vicky who were, who were going to be speaking, I said, yes, of course. Uh, I mean, we have kind of history of endless uh, independent groups, seminars going back uh, many, many years. Um, but I just want to start by pointing out the title uh, of this uh, evening session, Post-War Contemporary. And just to, to think uh, with that phrase, we've, we've already got various time frames in mind. We've got this kind of idea of kind of something after the post-war, but also this kind of strange word, uh, contemporary. And, you know, the, the, the very term contemporary, I think, is kind of worth uh, investigating a bit. I mean, one of the things that I was uh, reminded of when I, when I was thinking about kind of post-war contemporary was one of the first exhibitions to be held at the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London, which was called... 40,000 years of modern art. So there, in that exhibition title and the place it was, we've, we've got 40,000 years, we've got modern, and we've got contemporary, all kind of vying for, uh, for, 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 for a place, uh, congealing different times together, kind of creating temporal um, tensions. So I was kind of uh, minded to think, to, to look a bit further in, into, the, into the word contemporary. And I went to look into Raymond Williams's key words book to see if contemporary has a has a place there, and and it doesn't. It uh, goes from consumer to convention without missing a beat, without uh, taking us to the contemporary. Um, there's a recent book that Colin McCabe and some other people published called Key Words for Today, and I was thinking, okay, well, contemporary is bound to be in a key words for today, uh, but that goes. Um, straight from uh, consumer to corporate, which also kind of tells you something about 
the, the movement of, of, of those times from the, from the 70s to now. So I thought I'd do a little bit of kind of keywording uh, myself. Uh, so um, as, as Williams uh, does, I went to the OED, the Oxford English Dictionary of Historical Reference, uh, and looked to see what, what, was, what was happening to the word contemporary. And this word contemporary kind of trundles along for centuries, just meaning at the same time as. Uh, so you'd say Charles I was a contemporary of someone. Um, you know, it would never, it didn't mean a kind of noun, it's a kind of, you know, this is the contemporary. Uh, but it starts taking on that shape in about the, 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 the 30s and 40s. Um, and, and then kind of really kind of takes off as people talking about contemporary dance, contemporary architecture in uh, the 50s and 60s. And one of the, one of the quotes they have is from... Um, Len Dayton's novel, The Ipcress File, where the unnamed uh, narrator, who will be made famous uh, by, um, who's the actor? Michael Caine. <laughs> by my, Michael Caine uh, in the film. Michael Caine in, in, in the film. Uh, says, um, he's, he's kind of moving into a room and he says, it was a ta tasteful piece of contemporary natural wood finish doors, stainless steel windows, and Venetian blinds everywhere. So here, the contemporary has become a, a now, you know, a piece, a bit of contemporary, uh, a piece of contemporary. Um, and Len Dayton proves to be quite a good segue into our speakers, <laughs> because <laughs> it turns out that Len Dayton was uh, of course, the Royal College of Art, where our two speakers are, are from. He studied illustration there. He uh, wrote in the um, ARC uh, volumes, uh, did a lot of the kind of illustrations for that. And this is where people like Lawrence Alloway were, 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 were published, Richard Hamilton, and a whole host of others that we kind of associate with uh, the post-war contemporary. So it's a great pleasure to introduce the first speaker, uh, Victoria Walsh, who is Professor of Art History and Curating at the Royal College of Art and Head of the Curating Contemporary Art Programme. She is a curator and researcher whose projects span uh, from the post-war period to the contemporary with a particular focus on interdisciplinary collaborations between artists, architects and designers, reconstruction of exhibitions, practices and histories of gallery education, and issues of curating in relation to changing conditions of technology. In 2015, she led the Arena Sophia, how you say? Uh, major uh, retrospective of the artist's work in 2014, which built on her previous experience reconstructing the 1953 ICA exhibition, Parallel of Life and Art. With Claire Zimmerman, she co-curated the Tate Britain Research Display, New Brutalist Image, 1949 to 1955, and together they published um, the photo article, New Brutalist Image, 1945 to 55. But on a kind of personal note, I want to, uh, you, you know, just mention that, that Victoria's kind of extraordinarily kind of detailed curatation and uh, recreation of, of work has been a kind of real inspiration, I think, for this kind of period of, of art. I mean, it, it was absolutely what got me into all this uh, when I stumbled just kind of by chance on um, her exhibition of Nigel Henderson's work uh, in tw uh, 2002 in, in Edinburgh. And I, you know, I just got, thought, you know, I was blown away, never seen this work before, never kind of heard of this guy. Uh, and so that was kind of real, real kind of moment for me. Uh, so without further ado, Victoria, over to you. Um, th thanks, Ben, very much. You're always incredibly generous uh, in your introduction. So I wish I had a Cockney accent. Um, and I could say my name is, well, anyway, but um, right, let me.
Okay. Um, so thank you. Um, thank you very much, Ben, for that introduction. And, and thank you to the Paul Mellon Centre for this opportunity. Um, it sounds strange being in academia to say how rare it is to have such an opportunity to come and just think through ideas and, and to have that space and time and an opportunity. So I'm incredibly grateful, um, as I'm sure Ben is, that, that we, we, we have this opportunity to share some ideas. And, and it's in the spirit of, of wanting to put forward, and I may have overstated some of, of the ideas and arguments I, I wanted to put forward, but to, to put it in that kind of context of a seminar something that's in a kind of first, second draft of thinking that, that's got a long way to go and a lot more discussions um, between us, but great to be able to share it with you and get your, your feedback. Some of, the, some of the arguments I'm building on and playing with, I've made elsewhere before, but it's more about in the collective um, argument and, and the context of this current moment and in the light of the exhibition at the Barbican, the recent exhibition that, that my thoughts and this uh, paper of the next 20 minutes are particularly framed. So I will start. Um, walking around the recent Barbican exhibition, and I, I don't know those of you that saw it and those of you that haven't seen it, there's the full exhibition texts are, are on the Barbican's website, so do have a look. Walking around the recent Barbican exhibition, Post-War Modern, New Art in Britain, 1945 to 65, a prompt for this series of seminars, it would have taken a hardened visitor particularly after two years of physical constraints of access to exhibitions, not to feel the aesthetic pleasure and proximity of so many works staged for maximum visual and dramatic effect, particularly in the opening sequence and central galleries downstairs. Iconic works juxtaposed with lesser known sight lines determined by historical narratives of modernity and large scale confrontational works in conversation with more subtle and nuanced ones. As Lawrence Alloway might have noted, there was plenty of aesthetic distance to lift the works out and away from the distractions of the everyday. As the exhibition text described the period under review, as it wrote, certainty was gone and the aftershocks continued, but there was also hope for a better tomorrow. These conditions gave rise to the, an incredible richness of imagery, forms and materials in the years that followed. Focusing on the new, the exhibition explores the subjects that most preoccupied artists, among them the body, the post-atomic condition, the blitz streetscape, private relationships, and future imagined future horizons. So read the exhibition text. But what I asked myself, would Alloway have made of this deep aestheticization of the works on show and the claim that the exhibition was of subjects that most preoccupied artists? And why the emphasis on artists per se, when what was particularly notable and in flux at the midpoint of the time frame of this exhibition, 45 to 65, was the very separation of practices defined by the pre-war model of art school education. Indeed, as Alloway had noted in his now canonical article, The Long Front of Culture in 1959, the abundance of 20th century communications is an embarrassment to the traditionally educated custodian of culture. The aesthetics of plenty oppose a very strong tradition which dramatizes the arts as the possession of an elite. To approach this exploding field with Renaissance-based ideas of the uniqueness of art is crippling. Acceptance of the mass media entails a shift in our notion of what culture is. And herein lies a fundamental tension, a problem, I think, of the Barbican exhibition, that while trying to retrieve historically marginal representations and silent narratives of gender, race, immigration, it tried to do so through the existing aesthetic and hierarchic forms of a pre-mediatized world that empties out exhibits of all signification through their decontextualization and aestheticization within the logic of the exhibition display. As Alloway argued in, also in his off-site text and his argument around fine art, pop art continuum, the proliferation of popular culture, the impact of technology and the mass media meant, another well-known quote, the spectator can go to the gallery, the National Gallery by day and the London Pavilion by night without getting smeared up and down the pyramid. 
I think that pyramid, and, and there may be others here can uh, help it through, I think this is also a reference to Abraham Maslow's hierarchy, pyramid hierarchy of needs from a paper he published in 1948 um, around human motivations uh, in, in culture and life. In the absence of any potential smearing up and down the pyramid, the Barbican exhibition highlighted the exhibition narratives of an obliterated past, prevailing conditions of uncertainty, and an emphasis on future thinking, which its selected artists were claimed to represent. Temporalities of past, present, and future seem stable in these narratives, but the contention of this short paper is that one fundamental and important aspect of this period is missing, and that was the key concern and questions many artists had of how to make sense of the present to be both in time and with time, as Ben Cranfield has argued elsewhere. For many artists, being out of time, trying to locate oneself in time, was the prevailing struggle and project of how to make sense and locate oneself in the cultural continuum that characterized the everyday of city life under reconstruction. For the practitioners that I want to consider here briefly, the exhibition particularly conceived as a mediating form and technology presented itself as an effective vehicle further enabled by the mediating function of photography to make sense of the present. As I have argued elsewhere, the 1953 ICA iconic exhibition, Parallel of Life and Art, organized by, as we know, the Smithsons, Paolozzi and Henderson, recognized photography's capacity not only to unify a very disparate body of contemporary visual data to offer a snapshot of contemporary visual culture, but also to visually identify, and brackets perhaps propose question mark, patterns of association, practicing correlations, as Maholi Naj would term it, and providing what the anthropologists Ruth Benedict and Margaret Mead would argue as patterns of cultural association, patterns that through recognition would offer an insight into contemporary cultural meaning and social values. In short, reflexively working with the media of the day within the mediating framework of the exhibition, the group sought to make sense of the here and now. Comparable to Alloway's practice of writing through the present, what he called provisional art history, a form of art criticism, a kind of ethnographic deep descriptive writing, Parallel of Life and Art sought to write a new visual language, if not an alphabet, to decipher the conundrum and the paradox of the contemporary. And here you have, and I'm afraid it's reversed, I don't believe this image, um, it's, uh, it's, it's the wrong way, but um, this is an image I'm sure some of you are familiar with, the Nigel Henderson study for Parallel Life and Art, and it's often reproduced in black and white, which takes away the impact of the fact that it is on um, paper and that textual differentiation and, and heightened impact that this is a study, a collage of photographs put together. It is not for nothing, let me move forward. It is not for nothing that amongst the 122 photographic panels in Parallel Life of Art, many are to do with forms of writing and communication, in particular images taken from the British linguist and paleographer David Diringer's The Alphabet, a key to the history of mankind. Published in 1948. Indeed, as Maholi Naj had argued in Vision in Motion, identifying new ways of seeing the world was key to our age. And as the Smithsons wrote in their draft press release for Parallel Life and Art, this exhibition will provide this exhibition will provide the first atlas to a new world. The method used will present dramatic yet rational picture of the times, a kind of Rosetta Stone. And you can see here, taken directly from Duringer's uh, publication, um, you can see it typewriter and. Um, the Rosetta Stone is one of the key uh, parts of the publication. Um,
This exhibition, as, as I said, so the Smithsons, this exhibition will provide the first atlas to a new world. The method used will permit, present a dramatic yet rational picture of the time, a kind of Rosetta Stone. Also, of course, included in Duringer's text as the pinnacle of translation achievement. Patio and Pavilion, the second configuration collaboration of Tenderson, Paolozzi and Smithsons, clearly developed this ethos of how to make sense of how to locate oneself as with parallel life and art. And like parallel life and art, not only consistently beguiles, but eludes or resists narratives that close or confine it to any, contemporal, any temporal claims of future, futurity or indeed present. Multiple temporalities play out for the spectator, both in space as contemporary reviews detail, but also today through photographic representations. Again, I would argue that the photographic images of the installation provide a meta image, a totalizing yet inchoate one in waiting for translation for cultural analysis. From the, collecting, from the collective staging of the visual to the architectural staging of a set by the Smithsons to be occupied by Henderson and Paolozzi, is how uh, Smithson described it. Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, of his motivation for um, human, uh, human needs, comes to the fore more click, clearly. As Peter Smithson discussed in the BBC review of This Is Tomorrow, we worked on a kind of symbolic habitat in which are found responses in some form or other to the basic human needs, to basic human urges. The patio and pavilion are furnished with objects which are symbols for the things we need. The method of work has been for the architects to provide a framework and for the artists to provide the objects. In this way, and we all know that quote if we're familiar with this period, but I repeat it for the second part. In this way, the architect's work of providing a context for the individual to realize himself in, and the artist's work of giving signs and images to the stages of this realization meet in a single act. And it's almost a kind of translation of uh, Maslow's um, ideas of the hierarchy of needs um, for man to live a good life, with self-actualization being at the top of, of the pyramid. As is oft noted, Patio and Pavilion, with its overtones of archaeological and apocalyptic times, unfolded, as we know, in the same time frame that the Smithsons designed by invitation the House of the Future for the Daily Mail Ideal Home Exhibition in 1956. How to make sense of these two projects, these two sets of images, in thinking through what the modern, the contemporary, and even the present made possible could be. The contrast of poor materials to the slick, smooth surface of, of the modern have been topics of research for, for some time, as indeed the appearance of smooth surfaces. But as we know, the materials of the house of the future were not those that we perceive in the image, but mock-ups of plywood and other. But as Claire Zimmerman has argued, imagining and occupying these paradoxical presents of the post-war was inextricably tied up with the mediating aspect of photography. As Zimmerman writes, when being modern within the existing technologies of the building industry was not yet possible, looking modern might do instead. And I think this point about photography simulating uh, capacity. Coming to the end. The work of the photograph mediating and simulating how to be with time, past, present and future also opened up the possibility of how to choose to position oneself in time or equally to be or stay out of time. The prevailing and teleological assumptions that the call and response mode of modernity was a given for post-war artists, which the Barbican show suggested, denies not only the condition of a fine art pop art continuum described by Alloway, but also the cultural context in which we encounter the exhibition today. The lack of reflexive engagement, not only with the exhibition as media, but also with the mediatized practices and culture of the post-war art, empties out, or worse still, renders all works purely representational and indexical, 
rather than discursive, cultural or social. In many respects, this understanding or the understanding of photography within the exhibitionary context was much more sophisticated than this post-war period than perhaps today, despite the parallels of the proliferation of media and visual saturation. But to work with this sophisticated deployment of photography in the post-war period demands, in many instances, the research and tools afforded by art history, not just the provisional art history of Alloway or art criticism. As this final slide I would like to finish on gives hint to. On the left, you have the sepia image um, of the photograph that was uh, taken and used uh, in the This Is Tomorrow catalog, including the Eames um, chairs acting for the most part as supporting props. While on the right, you have the chairs performing and positioned as much as the subjects choose to position themselves in performative acts of potential self actualization question mark mediating and positioning and remediating oneself through the opportunity of photography was clearly in play in 1956 how we value and understand this legacy today remains elusive thanks very much Of course, today they'd uh, be likely to get run over by an Ocado delivery van. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's always so amazing, isn't it, that you see these streets and the idea of kind of doing something like that now and you know, how few cars there are. Oh, God. Um, great, thank you, uh, Vicky. Um, let me introduce the next speaker, Ben Cranfield, uh, Senior Tutor in Curatorial Theory and History on the Curating Contemporary Art Programme at the Royal College of Art. His research is focused on the relationship of the curatorial to notions of the contemporary and the archive, asking what it is to be with one's time. Stemming from his ongoing work into the histories of art institutions, the theory of archives, and shifting ideas of art and culture in post-war Britain. Recent articles include on not being with time queerly in post-war Britain, which I read on the train up here, uh, and is a great um, reading of uh, Mazzetti's um, Together uh, film, really great. Um, other other uh, essays include Mind the Gap, Unfolding the Proximities of the Curatorial, and All Play and No Work, a Ludistry. A Ludistry, is that how you say it? I didn't know that. <laughs> Uh, of, the curial, uh, of the curatorial as a transitional object at the early ICA. He also wrote a fantastic PhD on the ICA and the curatorial and kind of archives and um, was a really uh, amazing piece of work. So, Ben, over to you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you very much for the introduction. And um, I appreciate that final comment as one of probably the only people who've read that PhD, so <laughs> thanks, Ben. Um, and I have to say a huge thank you to Paul Mellon Center for um, yeah, accepting a uh, proposal to talk today. Um, as Victoria said, there aren't always the opportunities that we might imagine to have these kind of conversations, even with people you work with every day. Um, and it is, it's, it's gonna sound a bit Oscars, but it is genuinely a huge, honour to be speaking with Ben and Victoria, who have been incredibly important in my thinking and my work um, since I started engaging with this post-war period, um, well, quite a while ago now. So 10 years ago, let's go back, um, I gave a paper uh, at a conference called Bunk, celebrating 60 years of the independent group at the ICA. Um, oh, I should... If I just move myself, we should be there. Okay, yes, we should be there, yes. Um, and I talked about the idea of the parallel from parallel of life and art as an emergent space and thinking about what that idea of the parallel and between the parallel lines might be and do. Um, 
And at some point during that conference, I made a very basic observation that what I was talking through was not the exhibition. I wasn't talking about the exhibition, but images taken by a photographer, also a collaborator of the exhibition, Nigel Henderson, who was at that time experimenting with photography, as we've heard about already in this series. And I could and should probably have gone further and said, talking about images digitized and projected onto a screen, a basic observation that would have made sense, I think, to a room full of people interested in the independent group, whose mythic origins are often traced to back to Paolozzi's fateful epidioscope lecture. But it was Victoria who seized on the importance of this and initiated a conversation with me after the conference about collections, art museums, and disciplinary and institutional formations. And what Victoria helped me to understand was that a full engagement with mediation, not as an incidental issue of needing and failing to record or transmit that which was somehow more real, vital or important, irrevocably undoes given structures of cultural and artistic value. What the issue of mediation and its consequences are, sorry, whilst the, the issue of mediation and its consequences are transhistorical and transgeographical, of course, I think, as Victoria's just argued, the long post-war moment in Britain, and especially those artists and creative pra practitioners who circulated around the mythological space of the IG, can be understood to be a partic particularly concerned with the implications of living in a mediatized world, and a wiggling of the frame to not only upend or flatten the popular culture fine art hierarchy, but to rethink the entire way that being an agency in the world is constituted through practices of negotiation with the materialities of semiosis that operate through networks of more than human relations. And I thought about this when I visited, as we've already talked about, the post-war modern exhibition at the Barbican, when my attention immediately was arrested by the first image of the exhibition. Um, this image of the photographer Lee Miller in Hitler's bath. And it's a very complex and troubling image taken by Miller's collaborator, David E. Sherman, but, create, um, but credited in the exhibition as by Miller. And it's been the subject of a lot of really interesting analysis since its publication in Vogue in 1945. And I'm not gonna dwell here on the many layers of complex signification that weave through the image it is an image caught between wartime document and the mise-en-scene critique of aesthetic regimes and entwinements of racialized and gendered notions of beauty with horror, violence, death, and consumptive capitalism. What interests me here is the uncertain status of this image as a node in a network of cultural production and consumption. The accompanying caption in the exhibition describes the image as a radical document of performance art by a female artist resident in Britain. Now, whilst I find this retrospective claiming of Miller as a performance artist usefully provocative, I also wonder if this is not better understood as a performative document or a performance by Miller of the mediating mechanisms at her disposal. Miller knows that it's not Sherman that looks at her, but the readership of Vogue. She knows that this image will sit in a magazine in proximity to articles on beauty, food, and fashion on the table in someone's home within the mise-en-scene of their bourgeois domestic environment. This image then is not only a potential historical document, but a mediating agent that brought the disturbingly incongru incongruous discontinuity of the shared and unevenly experienced space-time of that particular present a present space-time designated by the prefix world in World War II into focus. Here, I'm intentionally invoking Peter Osborne's now well-known description of the contemporary as a, quote, disjunctive unity of present times. In his attempt to define the specific understanding of the contemporary as a philosophical premise drawn from an historical condition to which contemporary art responds, Osborne's focus is on the meeting point between global technological mediation, the collapse of a political horizon of socialism, and the dwindling of the projective realm of the future through the dominance of global capitalism. Contemporary art then for Osborne is both the art that fills the void left by the retreat of modernist futurity, 
and the space in which the operative fiction of the foreclosed contemporary can be revealed. Whilst Osborne marks the beginning of the slide towards the contemporary from the post-war, as from the post-war moment, specifically he locates it in Britain or mentions Britain, he notes that the contemporary had not yet at this time taken on its full specific meaning in terms of its periodic difference from the modern. As such, in the post-war moment, it merely marks a kind of up-to-dateness, a way of marking the most recent work of cultural production. And he says, quote, the contemporary was the most recent modern, but a modern with a moderated, less ruptural futurity, end quote. Osborne marks this moderate modernism of the post-war contemporary in Britain with the establishment of the Institute of Contemporary Arts. However, the ICA and that moment are not Osborne's focus for his theorization of the contemporary. But I ask, what if we do dwell in this uncertain emergent space of the contemporary before it becomes the preferred prefix of art and fully institutionalized within the networks of galleries and markets? What if we stay with the idea of trying to institute a space for the understanding of the contemporary? What would that mean? Who and what would it be for? What is it, after all, to be with time? The adoption of the term contemporary was for the ICA less of a programmatic gesture than it was a point of differentiation from its larger and richer American cousin, MoMA in New York. Similarly, the ICA Boston, a year after the formation of London's ICA, substituted the term contemporary for modern as a way to differentiate itself from the New York powerhouse. But whilst Boston specifically dropped the term modern to avoid its political connotations at the time in America, the ICA in London did so in order to avoid MoMA's museological overtones and return to what they say is the lost, its lost original mission of supporting living art or living artists. If modernism increasingly meant collecting art objects to furnish museums of art to hold the spirit of modernism in perpetuity, an institute for the contemporary was destined to be most particularly a space for the transient and the ephemeral. And it's unsurprising then that what is most remembered or talked about in terms of the ICA and not necessarily key works that it showed, but those exhibitionary experiments it gave space to, talks perhaps that were given, but maybe not even recorded, and mythic moments of performative eventfulness. To inhabit the space of the post-war contemporary in Britain, therefore, is to dwell not in the collection of art, but in the archive of ephemera. In a recent conference organized by Tate and Paul Mellon Center, on collage in Britain, I discussed, um, oh, I should have brought that up, it's nice. I discussed this image, which although it is a high res image is not coming out that well. Anyway, apologies for that. Um, and this image is, it's called Survival Kit and it was an image produced by the nascent group Archigram, although there were more people involved than those kind of core Archigram members, in 1963 for an exhibition at the ICA called Living City. And um, it appeared in Living Arts magazine, which was a very short run publication by the ICA and operated here in part as a catalog for that show. Now to my mind, Survival Kit is a primary example of the ephemeral archive of the post-war contemporary. So what do I mean by this? So firstly, to be able to apprehend one's present anthropologically as something that is qualitatively different from the past, one must first fragment the present into objects and images that can be analyzed metonymically in relation to something like a distinctive subjective experience of contemporaneity. Secondly, this process of archiving one's present to curate it back to oneself in order to grasp it from the distance, perhaps an ironic distance, means rendering it again as image, not to perform what Boris Grice calls the economy of modern and contemporary art, that is the transubstantiation of the profane into the sacred, but to recirculate the image using the ephemeral media of mass reproduction from whence you've taken those images in the first place. That the subjective, and thirdly, that the subjective positionalities that the image produces are not that of an idealized subject of the contemporary moment, but an uncertain, 
distributed and unfixed subject of multiplicitous and perhaps contradictory identifications through which the individual is mediated in relation to a collective, a collective of the present. And in talking about this, I'm tempted to use, well, I am going to use, but maybe I don't know if I should, um, a word from the discourse of British psychoanalysis at the time, another independent group, um, and call this objects like this survival kit transitional objects of the contemporary because they are both of the world and can be used to disenchant the individual of their authority over the world whilst enchanting the world again with the magical possibility of the individual's speculative potential. What makes this an ideal transitional object, I think, its ambiguities, its playfulness, its particular use of the curatorial, laying out the object alongside the collagic, is what I argued previously makes it a queer object. Furthermore, using the work of queer theory theorist Jose Esteban Munoz, I suggested that this image offers itself up for queer disidentification, a way of taking the image and using it beyond or perhaps against even its specific authored intentionality. Now I now want to pursue that line of thinking a bit further and suggest it is specifically by understanding this image to be part of an unfinished archive of the problem of the post-war contemporary, that is the problem of being in or out of time as subjects and agents of mediation, that this image must be disidentified towards the positions that were disavowed by the den then dominant discourses of timeliness. Survival Kit presents objects as images that are mass produced, disposable, desirable, and related to a mythos of the present as brought to audiences in post-war Britain through cinema, magazines, pulp fiction, and increasingly television. The supposition of survival kit, however, is not that these are the items that make the subject of the city contemporary, but rather that these are the objects required to survive in the contemporary city to construct a livable relationship with it. The survival kit in its wartime form was a vital collection of items that were used, especially by pilots, should they find themselves crashing in unfamiliar territory. Survival became not just synonymous with war, but with a future where the world had become unhospita unhospitable to human life. An idea brought to the popular imagination in post-war Britain by the figure of Dan Dare. There we are. Um, and, uh, who had not only had to survive on the unusual environment of, environment of Venus, but whose mission it was to find new food sources to help the survival of people on Earth. Surviving and living are intimately linked in the living city, the message being that one lived despite not because of the built environment, that the aim of this attack was modernist planning was explicit in the pages of the accompanying edition of Living Arts. To suggest that a survival kit, an exhibition, a poem or a collage could be part of architectural practice was to question the modernist hierarchy that had been at place at the formation of the ICA, that art was a testing ground that architecture would then make into social relations. But the contemporary seemed to reverse the equation. It was not, it was the ephemeral practices of everyday culture that would make the living city after, not before it was built. Survival kits suggest that to be contemporary is a matter not how modern or up-to-date one is, but how one navigates and survives urban alien landscapes. What survival kit and living city, for that matter, did not interrogate, however, was who it was, in particular, who had to survive in the city for whom culture was a matter not of continuity, but of collage and juxtaposition, for whom was being in time a matter of critical necessity and creative imagining. In disidentifying survival kit towards an archive, an archive of the post-war contemporary, it is what is there through absence or through an underlying present absence that needs to be drawn upon. Last time I discussed this image, I suggested that the triplicate present of John Coltrane invokes the vital importance of jazz and more generally black artists to the development of contemporary cultural thought, especially sub and countercultural thought in post-war Britain. Furthermore, I want to suggest that despite the masculinist, militaristic and misogynistic overtones of much of Archie Graham's imagery, the presence in survival kit of gender ambiguous metonyms alongside the underlying presence of Coltrane and jazz as the only identifiable subject in Living City, allows it to be used to invoke other synchronous and non-synchronous analyses of cultural belonging that may have been outside of the intentional purview of the image's collagic authors. In particular, the importance of jazz to cultural thought, um, 
and practice for those struggling to be contemporary speaks to the preeminent cultural thinker of the post-war period, Stuart Hall. What I want to suggest is that ephemera such as survival kit, because of their uncertain status as transitional objects of the post-war contemporary, not only invite diachronic and synchrotic connections, but require them to stop them from becoming fixed within given and dominant narratives of modern, <coughs> modernist and musicological progression. Under the auspices of Stuart Hall at the Birmingham Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies, the question of contemporary culture became not a what, but a how. How subjects come to understand themselves as not just the products, but also the agents of endless processes of material semiosis. It is not surprising that Hall was interested not in the singular products of culture, but in their movement, their usage, how culture comes to be lived, as this is where the agency of mediation is to be found. It is also not surprising that it was the diasporic subject that came to be the exemplary figure for Hall for the study of contemporary becoming, starting as he did with his own transitions, geographical, temporal, and political. I want to argue that the di diasporic subject, who I would add by necessity becomes a queer subject, is also an archival figure. Diasporic, diaspora and queerness not only trouble the fixity of identity, but also the temporal possibilities of the present as an assimilation within the value systems of the present. Whether that's because one's historicity is now not available within the official archives of culture, or because one has to live beyond the constraints of the present in order to survive. If the problem of the post-war contemporary as it manifests itself as an uncertainty of progressive cultural production within the titular formation of the ICA becomes most meaningful in the moment of survival, then the archive of the post-war contemporary must exceed that temporal moment because it could not be addressed by those who were denied access to or in excess of the official platforms where those questions were being answered. Therefore, we must open the archive of the post-war contemporary to other moments and places where such questions were being asked. Here I find the ICA useful as an institutional archive and an unfinished proposition. In 1980, over three decades after it was founded, and still 15 years before the exhibition Mirage was to bring the ideas of post-war thinker Franz Fanon explicitly to the ICA for the first time. A series of exhibitions took place that are now known as the Women's Exhibitions. Only four years, this is after the first major solo exhibition by a woman artist at the ICA had taken place in 1976, Mary Kelly's postpartum document. The women shows un coincidentally, coincidentally and unprogrammatically sought to ask how the positionality of women artists might rethink the space of the contemporary. One of the exhibitions, Issue, Social Strategies by Women Artists, curated by Lucy Lippard, produced an accompanying catalogue that didn't so much document the exhibition as create another platform as Living City had done, through which reproductive print media was used as a particular site of social praxis. One of the most pertinent uses of the format was by Adrian Piper. Piper, consistent with her exploration of mediated identity and political becoming, used a double-fold spread in the catalogue to explore her own arrival as a political subject. Accompanying a short text that recounts phases of understanding and self-awareness in relation to attempts at assimilation to collective identification are three photographs. These photos form part of an everyday apparatus of subjectivity, the family photo, the school photo, the passport photo. As I look at these photos alongside Popa's work, I'm reminded of the theorist Tina Camp's astonishing work on the Ernest Dyke collection in Birmingham. The Dyke photography studio operated from the 1940s to the 1980s, and they were, as Camp says, quote, the photographers of choice, many members of the city's largely working class Afro-Caribbean community, end quote. They commissioned po portraits for official reasons, but also to send to loved ones as, quote, camped again, material and effective objects of diasporic connection that instantiated practices of attachment, belonging, and relation between sitters and their recipients. The images that Camp had originally passed over when she first wrote about that archive as too flat in affect to be worthy of attention she now returns to in her book, Listening to Images. These are passport photos. 
Whilst Camp goes on to recount the ways that passport photos can be understood as part of a regulatory state apparatus and how they performed as part of the reshaping of, quote, post-war culture of the Black Atlantic, they are also part of what Camp terms quiet but not silent images. Specifically, what intrigues me in Camp's listening to these images that sit between their function as, quote, regulatory document and, quote, effective repository is how Camp understands these images to hold a resonance in their archival state. They are, after all, the leftover images of a photographic studio practice, what Camp calls orphaned images. They are ephemera that never fully become encoded with the apparatus of state border control. Camp understands their fugitivity as images, their persistence in time as part of a, quote, refusal to stay in one's proper place. And here Camp is quoting Judith Butler, um, or rather, they are part of the survival kit, I might say, of those who had no choice but to exist in a status of transience. To return Piper's and Camp's work to the ongoing archive of becoming contemporary in post-war Britain, I want to invoke one final image. This image is printed in the catalogue to post-war modern, but notably is not in the exhibition itself. The image was on the front cover of Francis Newton Sousa's exhibition at Gallery One in 1962. Gregory Salter reads this image as part of Sousa's self-fashioning of his brand as an artist, but also as a conscious play on stereotypes of migrants in Britain at the time, juxtaposing the good immigrant image of assimilated dress with a feared image, immigrant image of an animalistic and dangerous um, figure using the barbed teeth from one of his own paintings. Sousa doesn't resolve his identity, but taunts the potential public with their own projected fears and fantasies. But I'm also interested that Salter notes how the image can be seen as a taking back of artistic control by Sousa over his image, in difference to the shots of the artist taken by, taken by Ida Carr in 1958, in which Sousa looks out at the viewer with shyness, perhaps uncertainty from amongst his artworks. Indeed, what Sousa's cut-up self-portrait performs is an act of mediation that inverts a more usual relationship between the reproduced image and the painting. And it's hard, I think, it's hard for me anyway, not to see a reversal of Francis Bacon's gaping Pope mouth taken as he did from Battleship Potemkin and then re then de ephemeralized in paint. Instead, Sousa remediates his paint, his painting back into the circulation of mechanically reproduced images to intervene in the mediascape of image production. So to finish, I just want to observe that in a recent talk, the senior curator of Postal Modern, Jane Allison, spoke of the opening work in the exhibition being John Latham's 1961 full stop. I was surprised to hear this. What about Miller's performative image that opens the show? But perhaps Allison is right. Miller's image is not a work in Post or Modern, but an uncertain and mobile image in the unfinished archive of the post war contemporary. Thank you. Right. Oh, okay. So now we have um, discussion, <laughs> conversation. This is how it goes. Um, so, yes. Yeah, so I think. Uh, to start with, then, I'll kind of pick up on that kind of last point uh, of, you know, differentiating between uh, the modern and the unfinished contemporary, you know, as these kind of being uh, distinct things. I mean, one, one of the things I was, I was interested in was the uh, images of John Coltrane, Ornette Coleman, um, in the uh, Stuart Hall, John O'Comfra film, you've got Miles Davis kind of going all, all, all the way through it. And you have, um, but jazz, that is modern jazz. People talk about modern jazz. It doesn't seem to be as kind of problematic as, uh, as your discussion of the, the, the modern and the contemporary. So I kind of wonder if, um, if there's a kind of, you know, long form of culture, if we're kind of moving with Alloway to a kind of, I guess, more inclusive range, where does the modern and the contemporary sit? Is the modern within the contemporary, but now popified? I was thinking of Thomas Crowe's uh, new book, 
where it's very much about the mod, you know, the, 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 and he mentioned Lawrence Alloway as a mod, you know, self-actualized self mod, uh, if you like. So how would you uh, both place the modern and the contemporary in, in, in a kind of relationship? I'll, I'll have one little thing, but I think Please. it probably connects what I think more so. I mean, one of the one, one of the things that I think um, I'm always struck by is, is is how belated modern is. I mean, modern doesn't doesn't emerge as as a functional category in in um, in, in popular terms. Put it put it that way. In terms of when when Alloway. Um, the embrace of modernity. Well, let me let me start again. I think he threw the kind of resistance to ideas of modernity calling and being the answer to the to the moment. And one of the things that um, I think is is kind of curious about um, figures like Hamilton, like Henderson, the Smithsons, is the recognition of the call of modernity and the opportunity of modernity, but the irreconcilability. Of acquiring the modern in the current. So you have the aspirations, you have the simulation, but you equally have in a lot of the works the kind of clues, the anomalies, the cues to suggest that, that, that this is an aspiration and an ambition that is compromised or complicated by the unknowingness of the present or the complexity of the present. So that kind of tension, and I think brutalism, and I think one of the arguments. Um, Claire Zimmer and I try to make in, in the Brutalist Image display at Cape Britain was that tension between um, the kind of imaging of modernity and, and the grid, but then the messiness of the everyday and the layering. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the messiness um, being used there as a disruptive strategy to call modernity account as, as a not yet, as a project becoming. I think Henderson's photographs of Hans Stanton is, is one of those classic examples where you have the grid, the transparency, the modernity of steel and glass being erected, um, confounded and confused by the materiality of the image or the tap, the muddy tap, dripping water in, in furrows of, of, of land. And that kind of tension between image, aspiration, and the moment in time, um, I, I think. It sets up a contemporary in, in tension with the modern. So that's sort of yeah, yeah. Sort of I was thinking of the wheelbarrow, the image of the wheelbarrow yeah. on that. Uh, ben. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I so I guess there's a few things. There's a few things. I guess I would pick up on that. Um, the, what interests me about the the usage of the word modern, the contemporary in this in that moment is exactly is the reason why Osborne's less interested in it, which is that it's not really anything, it's, 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 it's interchangeable, it's not, it's, it's not quite clear what it is, it's not really a position as such. So I think we are still very much within that. Um, uh, yeah, we're, 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 we're still very much talking kind of through the language of, of, of modernity. Um, I don't think that we're talking about the contemporary being a kind of really conscious kind of rupture, you know, break, periodic break. And certainly we're not talking about it as a kind of affect, um, uh, an active prefix of art. But it is interesting when you talk about the mod, because I think the kind of thing there is I would say that that is the, um, the idea of the modern repurposed um, in relation to the function of being contemporary. So that's, as sort of I think Victoria is kind of pointing to as well, it's about how do you relate to those the different kind of temporalities within your kind of self-fashioning, I guess, to some extent, which is a different thing from necessarily being concerned with some kind of projected futurity about what, you know, how cities or whatever should be planned and constructed. It's more about I am modern now as I'm, because I am not, you know, because I am creating a generational break or whatever it, it, it might be. But I guess for me, the other thing is that there's a um, there's something more methodological that's opened up. I think by what I'm suggesting about not, try, not trying to cleave them apart, particularly, but, but whether one understands this in relation to trying to think through 
traditions, traditions of the new, right, traditions of modernity, or whether one is kind of concerned with the issue regardless of, 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 of the problem of temporal belonging, which is obviously absolutely part of kind of modernism, you know, all the way through, but is a specific problem. And I'm sort of saying, well, what if we pay attention to that specific problem? And it's interesting for me to, for example, that Corbusier, when he shows at the ICA, shows um, uh, tapestries. So again, the tapestry, to my mind, is this kind of, you know, literally putting back in the kind of weave and texture of the present, of the now, back into the space of the modern, in the same way that I, th and, and it's interesting that Colin St. John Wilson writes about that and does the catalogue for that, because I think that there is this idea of kind of looking at the underside of modernism, where you're concerned with the texture, and this is liquid concrete, and there was another version of this presentation which is all going to be about the textures, you know, and what gets caught in Bretton Brut and etc. And what we constantly find is that, is that process and contingency and the kind of and, 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 the, and the, the kind of now of temporality in the process of making constantly gets kind of captured on the surfaces of modernism, glass, screens, concrete. And I think that's kind of what, what we're playing with here, rather than saying that there is, we can kind of say, well, that's modern and that's contemporary. And that's not, I, don't, I don't think that's possible, certainly not this period. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, kind of following on from that, I mean, I, I suppose one of the things I'm getting from that is that uh, the, the, in some senses, the modern, you know, for a mod or something, it is a kind of non-rarefied uh, idea of a kind of progressive form kind of stretching into the future that, 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 that you know, cert only certain people have kind of access to. And I was kind of very taken uh, with your sense here of, 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 of this work being about trying to understand the, the present moment, you know, that, that there was some sort of difficulty that needed to be understood. And, and how much this work, uh, I mean, you use uh, Ruth Benedict's Margaret Mead, um, the, uh, the hierarchies of need, um, you, you know, work coming from before the war, uh, uh, I mean, Ruth Benedict's book, book is from the 30s. And how, how, how does this kind of inform how you're kind of thinking about these artists. I mean, it, it strikes me that, that kind of self-actualization isn't necessarily one of their goals, mm -hmm. but actually it's a more kind of research project uh, that it's, it, it in itself is kind of anthropological, an anthropological way of thinking about the kind of anthropology mm -hmm. of the now. Um, so, so that kind of idea of the kind of art as being research and maybe art and, and, and being kind of former cultural studies um, for this kind of period. Uh, and, and it's, I mean, one of the reasons I think this, this kind, of, kind of feels very kind of relevant is because is a lot of art today feels like cultural studies too. You know, it feels like a kind of, you know, a, a social project, relational art. As, as, so what, what makes this time you know, so fruitful for for doing kind of re art as research. Mm. I mean, I think I think what, what, one of the things that's that's inherent, and um, I suppose where the frustration or, or my kind of frustration of the problematic of, of the Barbican exhibition is that the very questions that many of the practitioners, not just artists, were 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 constantly playing with was that the hierarchies of knowledge, the organization of practices, you know, the, the specializations, the pre-war organization of systems of knowledge and taste and value, you know, were, were, were already fragmented pre-war, but, but post-war become completely redundant in discussions of how to reimagine and restructure the present and the future. And obviously, Alloway is the first to, to really sort of put the case for the dissolution of the categories. Um, and I think what uh, you know, many of the artists, and obviously, Mag, you know, Cordell and McHale and the others are also, and Hamilton in particular, sees the opportunity that research has to pull into the frame 
all the different discourses, disciplines, um, and practices that um, had already come into crossover discussions um, in other spaces that were needed to, to imagine this new moment because that separation of science and technology and the arts you know, was not going to produce the world that was relevant or happening in the everyday. And, and I think, you know, every time one hears, and, and of course we've been at conferences, you said, or exhibitions for 25 years now, but every conference and exhibitions manages to claim that there, is, there are resonances between the here and now, the post-disciplinary, the interdisciplinary collaboration, that all those things are relevant now, but we're still resisting them. We're still in 19th century structures of knowledge and practice and taste and value in many respects, as I think the exhibition highlighted, that those the, that organization of culture and value actually fundamentally hasn't changed. Um, and so that research project is ongoing. And I think that's why we keep returning to a lot of these practitioners and groups because the kind of questions they were tangling with still resonate today, but we still have the same infrastructures, the same codes and systems of signification in a way. We're not looking at exhibitions as technologies that are mediatized. We still seem to be thinking in highly aestheticized, modernist terms of, of, of consumption of art, not as culture. I mean, your own book made that, made that case you know, around brutalism. And why, you know, despite Birmingham, despite Stuart Hall, despite the many other moments we've had, why, what is that continued investment in the category of art? Well, we, we know what those are. It's the art market, it's patronage. There are other investments. But I think the politics of that moment still have a currency um, that we're still working through and still actually working through and it's probably still beginning to work through yeah and i think i think just thinking about stuart hall and some of the discussions you know you know it's that politics of attention that, that that there is still the need to keep pulling attention on the same the same arguments and the same propositions and the same research by practice in a way it's the same it's, it's yeah. that argument yeah. um to keep it in frame because change is slow. I was just going to, I was just thinking, um, you know, uh, a text that I go back to quite a lot is Hall's Constituting an Archive, and she was originally given a talk, um, you know, give, give, given as a talk um, at Tate uh, around the kind of formation um, of of the archive, really, of um, Black British artists, uh, constructed by Eddie Chambers. And I think what's really interesting about that text is it's an absolute celebration of the work that Chambers and others have done, which is around the kind of defiance of a certain erasure. But there's something else in it. He's, he's, he's giving a warning. He's warning that, um, he's warning that we have to keep the archive, not just in its contents, but as a structure alive to the problems of the present. And in some ways, what he's saying is that if we just go, well, that's great, thank you very much, and include it within, you know, a canonical understanding of culture, then we may have solved a kind of small problem for now, but we haven't necessarily created a new structure which is going to be applicable and useful for ongoing generations um, of artists to think about. And I think he's also hinting at the fact that, con that, that those, concept those conceptions around identity and belonging and who's included and who's not included, them, they will continue to be challenged. So if you set something up and you put boundaries around it, and you're not alive to your doing of that, then you're going to be challenged further down the line if you don't, you know, if, yeah. about what those boundaries are. And so the reason why I think that, you know, the, the word archive is interesting rather than collection is not here because I'm thinking about, you know, the, the institutional archives 
as necessarily a kind of source of revisionist history, which, you know, of course, that's a very valuable work that they're doing. But I'm thinking about could they, can they be perceived, and actually it's easier to conceive of that in, within the within digital world, right? But can they be conceived rather as this kind of, much more as the archive is understood within a digital context, as a kind of constantly accessed memory? And therefore, a kind of place of interchange. It's not the final stage of a deep, a deep, you know, repository where it goes from office to repository to archive in the traditional sense. Rather, the archive is always that holding place where something is waiting in abeyance to be picked up again and rethought. And, I, and, I, and for me, that's kind of what Hall is also doing with contemporary culture. He's saying the way we understand culture itself has also got to be this kind of constant creation of our own kind of archive, our own series of reference points, our own kind of series of points of reflection, to be able to grasp these moments within this kind of constant network of mediation. And it's not surprising to me in a way that, you know, Birmingham Kendra Cultural didn't survive, and it's not surprising to me in a way that Hall's thought needs to be kind of constantly resuscitated, but it is being really right now kind of looked at, because it's very difficult to maintain that place because you are constantly undoing the infrastructures of value that would allow you to claim a kind of permanent position within a kind of cultural field. But in terms of the post-war moment, I think what kind of makes it interesting going back to is, is in some ways, you know, a moment of opportunity, right? Lots of, lots of people going to our college, even if they weren't necessarily thinking of being artists. There's an opportunity and a possibility to go and experiment and play without necessarily the idea that I'm going to become this. And that, of course, is makes for a very kind of fertile space the ground. But also we could say there's a, there's a poverty as well that makes it kind of fruitful in as much as, you know, if you fast forward 20 years, you've got a much more um, dominant art market, a much more available art market that people can work towards being a part of. That wasn't necessarily there at that point. So, you know, we see that with members of the independent group who start to then refashion their kind of work very much in relation to kind of a market. So I think what we can say is it's a kind of unmooring moment, and that's what makes it interesting to kind of go to go back to not to mention I'd say a whole ton of unresolved issues and problems and questions. Right. Thank you. Uh, it's more than you wanted, isn't it? Sorry. No, no, that's, that's great. That's great. I'm meant to be talking. Uh, about. So we've got a quarter of an hour. Um, open the floor to you, lovely people, and you, lovely people on on online. Uh, you've got some questions coming from the... Uh... Yeah, we've got um, several great questions from the online audience already, but I'm going to pitch in with one from Harriet Atkinson, who's director to Victoria. Um, thank you for a wonderfully rich and thought-provoking paper. Is it possible to draw a distinction in terms of the temporal encounter between independent group exhibitions such as Parallel of Life and Art and earlier exhibitions constructed from photographs that were also focused on making sense of the present, albeit in a very different context, e.g. propaganda exhibitions produced during World War II by the British Ministry of Information. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> oh, um, I'm, I'm thinking that one through. I mean, I think, um, What do I think? I mean, one of one of the things that um, what was the core of this first part of that? Well, it's, sorry, it's, it's, so it's asking about. Um, well, it's kind of. I think it's asking you to explore really about oh. the way the exhibitions of the nineteen fifties that you were showing were using photography compared to earlier oh. exhibitions that had a different kind of propaganda purpose in the yeah. war. I mean, I think potentially yes, in the sense. I suppose what, what I was um, what I was particularly interested in and was trying to sort of draw out was the way with parallel life and art they were thinking through not 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 necessarily recent but more in recent circulation you know theories and discourses around iconology and iconography and trying to think through um, how the visual 
could be interpreted and understood um, you know, at the level of symbol rather than at the level of just interpretation and discourse. And I think in that sense, what it was heralding, you know, was the awareness of how images communicate and trying to, to bring that into focus um, through a very concentrated form and obviously supported by recent, not so recent, but more recent sociological and anthropological thinking. In that respect, yes, I think you, you, you could um, apply the same. Um, But I think the politic, I, I think the politics of what was being proposed and why that was being applied, you know, would be very different and, 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 and the cultural conditions in which the questions of how images are signifying and circulating and producing that, you know, the cultural specificity of that moment has to be, has to be retained in the account. There's also playfulness that was in there as well with that because that culture of wartime exhibitions runs deep through the ICA mm -hmm. at that mm -hmm. time, you know, the use of black mm -hmm. and what we were involved in design and the use of black was very exhibition design, but in some mm -hmm. ways, you know, that's what you know, it starts with 40,000 years, and 40,000 years is designed specifically sort of like a lot of those wartime exhibitions were to be kind of informative spaces, but also experiential spaces for the public. And obviously Hamilton's interested in that, but when Hamilton and others are taking it up, it seems to me they're as much interested in exploring that mechanism mm. as they are just kind of using it. And I think that's that kind of, that, that, that's the difference, isn't it? When we, when we move into a space of cultural analysis, really. And I think it's, you know, the difference and in, in, in where Hamilton, you know, separates out from ideas in, in kind of strategies of thinking about design as opposed to cultural propositions per se. We've got a, a question over here. Mark Griffiths. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you. Um, I very much agree with the critique that, that you've made of the Barbican show. And I think it's obviously partly a problem of a kind of periodization that they wanted. You know, pop was the 60s and they weren't concerned with that. Um, but I think that there's equally perhaps a problem with um, uh, seeing the exhibit, seeing the period through 2022 eyes as well, and a, a kind of academic culture of, you know, um, art by research, and um, equally a problem, I, I think, perhaps of seeing the 50s through the lens of the of Birmingham cultural studies of the 60s. Um, and I wanted to go, I actually wanted to go to, to something quite specific, in a sense, to think about this, which was uh, Victoria quoted um, the Smithsons on the parallel of life and art show, which, of course, you know, is it, going to create endless interpretations. We, have, we heard a wonderful one last week, actually, by uh, yes, um, I can't remember your name, but we had a wonderful paper about it. Um, and and this, you quoted the Smithsons as saying, um, what was it? Um, the exhibition uh, would, would create quite a dramatic yet rational picture of the times, which kind of seems very peculiar. And uh, obviously, as we know, the Smithsons were only really involved in the very early stages of parallel of, of life and art. Um, but at the same time, it's kind of, it, it kind of gives us a kind of clue, may, maybe an answer to that question Ben asked about the modern and the contemporary, you know, whether the Smithsons are thinking in a too modern and not enough contemporary way, and whether actually Henderson and Palazzi, seeing through the exhibition, were thinking more in terms, not of the rational, but of rationalities. Um, and um, in other words, a kind of relat relativism perhaps is more of a key to um, one key to what's going on in that show. Um, uh, and in a sense, allowing us to, to, to make of it all the, thing, the wonderful things that we have made of it. And relativism, of course, is a key to so many other things of that mid 50s 
post-war, butskillism and, and all those other kind of like toning down of political, of political edges and extremes. What do you th think of that? Um, I wouldn't disagree. <laughs> I mean, I think, as I said, well, I over, slightly overstated it, but I think, um, I mean, I think there was a reason f for the collaboration. I think there were the, you know, how do you reconcile Henderson's um, concerns with Victorian memorabilia alongside a stressed image, alongside, um, but, um, so I think that the, the you know, as I say, hands up first, second draft, it, it, it's a slightly overstated to make a point of sorts, but, um, but that said, I'm not sure, I'm, I, I, I would defend the proposition that this was a, a kind of research project that's not a, 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 of today. They, they write of it in, in and of that time, as does Hamilton, that exhibitions are, are research. They, you know, there are propositions, there are grids of, of propositions and um, tables of information behind exhibitions. And, you know, the formulation is one of, um, of thinking through questions and answers. So, you know, that might sound expanded in current day uh, practices, but, but I think they were, they were genuinely motivated um, and confronted by trying to inhabit and understand um, the contemporary, but, but of, of the moment they were in. But I mean, I think one of the things that is elusive um, and we, we, you know, those looking at the area is just how did class differentiation play out in terms of understanding uh, a sense of belonging and with time. And that's, you know, Anne Massey's made that point about the exhibition, but that's an ongoing issue around the kind of his historiography of this, of this moment. Um, but I don't think there's a, I, I, I would defend the over-determination, but it might be overstated to the exclusion of, of a, a much more pluralistic and, and cultural relativist uh, understanding of the exhibition. But I think what has been underestimated, you know, is the role of photography. I mean, Hamilton uses it to the same effect as a meta image, you know, with clues and prompts. You know, I mean, the image that I left up and didn't entirely complete of the four of them for This Is Tomorrow has a classic, what I would call sort of Henderson Hamiltonian uh, game in there which is Smithson encouraged myself and somebody called Martin Harrison to reconstruct the photographs. So have you been there? Have you been there? Have you been there? Have you been there? Limiston Street is where we lived. Thank goodness for Martin Harrison being a very um, train spotting type of uh, art historian of sorts. We went back and reconstructed it and, and the, the, the position at which the photograph was taken outside 46 Limiston Street where the Smithsons lived is at the intersection of somewhere called Camera Place. And you know, that was a classic, um, classic sort of moment of, of, of taking attention about photography and its role. Um, you know, one of many games of which Hamilton has many behind the scenes. So I think, um, yeah. Can I just, uh, yeah, I'd like to ask a question prompted by uh, Vicky's uh, reading of uh, Paradise and Life and Art, but really directed at you, Ben. Um, when I was very struck by the, the ways in which this, the, you, you were reading um, the exhibition and it was being uh, articulated at the time in relation to the Rosetta Stone. And that, that idea of a, a, an iconography that had taken centuries to decipher, but, and, and, you know, and that it had taken years of scholarship and difficulty to decipher this incredibly elusive and difficult language and that somehow life and art was uh, parallel enough it was doing something it was trying it was digging deep and finding a, a new language that was going to be uh, that expressed the contemporary but did so in a way that was very hard to read and of course has remained incredibly hard to read as all the different kind of interpretations that we're seeing in the series have, have proven when you juxtaposed a photograph ben of parallel life and art with the archigram image it felt like, it really did feel like we were moving, there were two totally different worlds. And it was, I mean, and it, in a way it's, the distinction fits the classic narrative of 
50s and 60s pop and, and brutalism. But one of the things that was so distinctly different between them, to my eyes at least, was that issue of legibility. That when you saw that imagery in Power Life and Art, it looked so difficult to read and it posed so many problems. Whereas with the archigram image, it was hyper legible. It was quite literally not only the labels were clear, but the images, the objects themselves are so obviously labeled. And it kind of provided a very it gave you something much more tangible to work with in terms of legibility and it just felt so different and I think I wondered what you made of at least to my eyes something that's so distinct when in some ways you were suggesting a kind of parallel between them. Um, yeah I guess a kind of a, a, a few things I mean so I wouldn't say they're the same at all I mean I guess I would say kind of I guess there's a couple of things. One is from a period, periodizing point of view. I, I mean, they don't look any further away, do they, than House of the Future looks from Patio and Pavilion. And I think that's the kind of thing that I think Ben really explores so well in, 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 in his book, which is that how can you have very kind of different concerns that appear visually to look so different actually as part of similar questions, you know, coming from similar questions. So similarly, if we look at the This Is Tomorrow catalog, so that's very close to Parallel of Life and Art, you've also got that thing about labels, right? An image that's all labeled up and playing with the idea of information because this is a big question, you know, where does, you know, there's a challenge, as far as I understand it, to significant form and the language of significant form and instead moving towards kind of thinking about the idea of information and, and what we do with that. Um, so there's that, I guess, sort of answering that question, but also, I guess, answering a kind of implied question from Mark as well, is that, um, of course, the questions shift and of course, the language shifts and of course, the, the imaging shifts, but there are seeds being sown that I think absolutely are the proposition around cultural studies. So, you know, I've said it, kind of said it many times, but, you know, in the um, same time of Parallel of Life and Art, they're proposing to the film department of the ICA to do a series, not of film showings, but of discussions about popular cinema. And what they're really looking at is not, is all sorts of things about how popular cinema is made, wanting to look at Hollywood as a kind of system, um, which is part of a much later analysis that you wouldn't really get into kind of, you know, Laura Mulvey and, and a much later moment of really trying to analyze the mechanics um, and ideologies of Hollywood production. Um, but also wanting to take things like Marilyn Monroe as another whole part of this, which is images of Marilyn Monroe, um, you know, wanting Marilyn Monroe apart as an anthropological kind of signifier. What is, um, what is Monroe? And, and, and I've said this so many times because I just love the response. Brenda Poole, who was organizing, it was very much part of the ICA establishment, although she was really administrator, but she was organizing the film program. So they think there's a lot, they think there's something to be learned in asking about Marilyn Monroe and why she's so popular. And she says, I would have thought that I could answer that very easily, but they tell me I'm oversimplifying things. So, and I think that's a kind of real sort of, there's a real d line around an idea that, that the ICA or something like that is, should be a space for avant-garde kind of production and for the kind of, um, for really the exploration of kind of significant form versus the idea that you might flip the whole thing and make it a space to explore contemporary culture as it, as, as it, as it were. So the Archigram Survival Kit, in my mind, is a very kind of IG object. Um, but I think there's a kind of, and I, and I think the kind of key thing is in the way in which, it, uh, you know, Bannon calls Parallel Life and Art the locus classicus of new brutalism. Um, and both of two people here are better place to speak to that than me. But I think what's kind of interesting there is that we have to understand that this is a provocation to certain groups of people, particularly say to architecture students or others, this is going to make sense to them. So it might be kind of quite illegible to us, but it's kind of the illegibility is the message to some extent. You can't make sense. I and mean, I said this to when you showed that image of them standing in front of the col you know, the collage image. To me, it's kind of an absurd image. They're too close, they wouldn't be able to see anything. So it's a kind of piss take about the legibility of exhibitions as public information, I think. And I think so in that way. I think it is complex, but I also think as image, it's also, it's quite a straightforward kind of mm, to, you can't make sense of this. 
your tools for making sense of culture don't work here. And I think that absolutely chimes with Archigram, who were essentially the children of the independent group in that sense. My watch says it's half past seven, which means we have to draw this to a close. Uh, if you've got further questions uh, for our, our speakers, there's a, a wine reception afterwards. You can pigeonhole them, pigeonhole them? Buttonhole, I don't know. Uh, and for people online, if you have uh, questions, unanswered questions, then email. Uh, their emails are very easy to find on the they internet. They're not. They're not. They're, they're, the RCA likes to keep it, stuff like that very well hidden. It will get through to us. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so once more, can I ask you to a uh, round of applause for our speakers?